Hey, Lanier Point, we just uh, welcome you to our online service today. I just want to invite you to sing along with us. Heaven thundered and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you form. Faith commanded in the mountains of
Yes, Lord. We do. We want to see you. Come and open our eyes. We need to see you. We need to hear from you. We need truth, Lord. There's so many voices all around us saying different things to us, saying conflicting things from one another. But Lord, we know that you are consistent. We know that you are true. We know that you are always the same. You are always good. So Lord, we just ask you, come and speak to us. Come and speak your truth, the truth, because you are the truth. And we need to hear from you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Everybody, please say amen. Welcome, everybody. It is so good to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, today, of course, is Father's Day, and uh, we're just out of the gate. We would to just say uh, happy Father's Day to all the dads. We hope that you have a very happy and uh, blessed day. You know, uh, Father's Day is a relatively new holiday. I don't know if you know that, but Mother's Day, they started celebrating in it in like 1908 in churches, and they made it an official U.S. holiday in 1914. Father's Day got celebrated, started much later, and it didn't become uh, an, an official U.S. holiday until 1972. <laughs> I found that out this week. I couldn't believe it. So Father's Day is just struggling so hard to catch up with Mother's Day, and uh, we always try to do our part here at Lanier Point. If you know anything about our church, you know that we love celebrating and honoring the dads, and uh, you know, I, in fact, let's just do that. Dads, I just want you to know uh, we love you. Uh, we're thankful for everything that you do. We appreciate you. If you're near a dad right now, just pat him on the back or give him a hug or slip him a $100 bill, whatever you, know, whatever you think they'd appreciate the most there. <laughs> if you're not near a dad, you can uh, send them the money via PayPal. You just send it to me, and there's just a very small handling fee, and I'll get it to them, I promise you. Uh, but in all seriousness, we just want to say, dads, uh, we love you, and we're very, very thankful for you. You know, I want you to know um, that to me, and I think most dads feel this way, um, having kids, having my kids, uh, in my life is, 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 is one of the greatest joys of my life, bar none. And uh, my kids mean everything uh, in the world to me. And I think most dads say, you know, I would agree with me and say I'm the same way, you know. And uh, obviously being a dad is this uh, wild and woolly and wonderful adventure. And, uh, you, know, there's, uh, you know, there's some lows in there, but there are tons and tons and tons of highs and highlights and wonderful moments, and it is really one of the greatest things in the world. And, uh, and I think pretty much if you asked any dad, you know, uh, how awesome is it being a dad, they would say it is really awesome uh, being a dad. I think they'd also tell you probably if you ask them, do you feel like you know what you're doing as far as being a dad, they'd say, oh, absolutely not. <laughs> I don't know of a single dad alive that would say, you know what, I got the whole dad thing nailed down, I've mastered fatherhood, you know, check that off, I got it all figured out. I think it is uh, one, of the, one of the most challenging things in the world to do, to try to just be uh, a good dad. And unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, sort of bad advice floating around out there 
about, you know, uh, what it takes to be a dad or what dads should be doing. There's a ton of advice, and uh, some of it's good. Some of it's just, it's, it's good sounding, but it's sort of nonsense when you get down to it. And so, you know, my advice to everybody is when you're talking about uh, parenting in general or fatherhood or anything like that, just take all the advice you get with a grain of salt, you know. And, and particularly if you're hearing from somebody that's never had a kid, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, maybe they got some good insights, but maybe not. I'm embarrassed to admit this to you. I'm very embarrassed. But I was, I was a pastor before I was a dad. I'm not embarrassed about that part. But I'm embarrassed that I actually taught on parenting. I talk, I've taught about how to be a dad before I was ever a dad. And I look back on that, and I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, what was going on? I think somebody back then should have just stood up and punched me in the face and said, hey, you're not a dad, will not you sit down, you know, kind of thing. Because I had all these theories about uh, what it was to be a dad and what it meant to be a dad and all this kind of stuff. But all, all that sort of just fell by the wayside real quick. Uh, when I actually became a dad, you know, and so I thought today for Father's Day what we would do is sort of push aside all the sort of random advice and all the stuff you hear and just go straight to the source and uh, see what God has to say, our Heavenly Father, the perfect Father, see what He says about being a good dad. And, And let me just out of the gate say this, there's no such thing as a perfect dad other than our Heavenly Father. And so God's goal for you is not that you would be perfect, uh, but I, you know, what I want us to focus on today is f- for all the dads, I want to encourage you and I want to say, look, here's, you know, don't worry about so many things. Don't worry about doing everything that everybody says you need to do. I, I just want you instead to focus on these things. I think this is what God says we need to focus on to just be good, solid, reliable dads that, that God is, is proud of. Now, th- to get to that, we're going to do something a little interesting. We're going to look at a story that Jesus taught. Jesus would make up these stories from time to time. We call them parables. And he would make these stories up to, to illustrate really important things. And one time he was uh, illustrating uh, how much God loves people. And it was so important to him, he actually taught three stories back to back to back because he really wanted to get it across. And the final story is the big payoff story, and it's called the parable of the prodigal son. It's about this son who uh, goes a little wayward, and comes back, and he experiences this uh, extravagant love from God. And if you read the story, the story's clearly about the son, and it's also about his brother and some other things going on. But today I don't want to focus on the son so much. Uh, What I want to do today is I want to focus in on um, what Jesus teaches in that story about the dad. There's a dad in that story, and the dad is being set up as a great dad. And so what we're getting, if we read between the lines, what we're getting from Jesus is what he says, this is what a great dad does. This is what a great dad, a great earthly dad, not a perfect dad, but a great earthly dad does. He's going to focus on these things. And as far as Jesus is concerned, as far as God is concerned, this is sort of what a good dad looks like. And so we're going to focus in on that. But before we do, I want to say something. I hope um, that what we learn today as we study the story of Jesus and we study how God sees uh, earthly fathers and what they need to be doing, I hope that it encourages all the dads and it blesses all the dads. I mean, that's the whole reason we're doing it. But some of you, you know, you're not dads. <laughs> and for you, I want you to be thinking in this story as we go through it about how this relates to God's love for you, your heavenly father and how he sees you. And he's saying, this is how I want earthly fathers Uh, to act, but he's also, he always does all this. So I want you to see uh, his hand in your life as we look at all these things. All right, so Jesus, in teaching this story, gives us four broad principles. He says, look, if you do these four things, you're going to be a good, solid dad. Not going to be a perfect dad. No such thing as a perfect dad other than our Heavenly Father, but you're going to be a good, solid dad. He basically says, I want you to focus on four things. So write these down, if you will. The first one, number one, is this. Uh, 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 every dad should, should strive to be available and approachable. Would you write that down, please? You're striving to be available and approachable. What I mean by that is dads should always be open. They should be open and approachable uh, by their children. Their children should feel like they can come to them. They, they, they should always be willing to hear from their kids. They should always be willing to talk to them, uh, interact with them, and talk about uh, whatever it is, no matter the topic. That, that, that they should do that. So let's just dive into the story and see how this plays out. 
Jesus started by saying this. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Now, <clears throat> this is a shocking statement even in today's culture. If you went up to your dad and said, hey, uh, you know, when you die, I know that half of what you own is going to go to me and half is going to go to my brother. And uh, uh, so I, I just want you to go ahead and give it to me now. I don't want to have to wait on you dying. <laughs> That's, that's a crazy thing to say. And it's shocking. It would be shocking to say that now in our culture. It was even more shocking uh, back then. And Jesus is setting this story up. with There's a bit of a shock value at the top. It's like, what? You know? And the dad agrees to it. And I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time trying to dwell on why the dad agrees to it. But the, the, the thing we need to get out of this is that the son felt, evidently, the son felt comfortable uh, enough to say this to his dad. He felt like, this is something I could talk to my dad about. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a really uncomfortable topic. It's an uncomfortable subject. It's a point which my dad's probably going to disagree upon. But I feel like he's the kind of guy that he's open to me talking to him. And that's really what I want you to get out of this first part of this story, is that this is a dad in this story, and we see it over and over again in the story, where the son feels comfortable coming to him, even when uh, the topic isn't going to be a fun topic or, or, the, or it's going to be a difficult thing to talk about. So evidently the dad was just open and approachable. And dads ultimately need to be approachable in, in two ways. When your kids are very little, I mean this is true their whole lives, but when they're, when they're very little, the thing they need from you more than anything else is just time. They, just, they need time. They're, they're not going to come to you with big ideas and thoughts and you know, debating different things. I mean, they have questions and things, but they really just ultimately need time from you. And that's something that you would, you know, hopefully you'll make time for your kids their whole lives and your whole life and that kind of thing. As your kids get older, they don't necessarily want to hang out with you very much. <laughs> and so they don't really, uh, you know, want that much time for you. But certainly when they're a kid, when they're really little, uh, they want and need time. So part of it is just making time available for the kids and that kind of thing. As they get older, however, um, the other way dads are approachable is by being willing to talk about things that might be hard to talk about. Really to be willing to talk about anything, but certainly stuff that might be a little more uh, uh, difficult to discuss. And this becomes a lot more important the older your kids get. Kids have this weird tendency, it's very annoying, but they start to come up with their own ideas and their own, <laughs> their own thoughts and their own ideas and their own way of seeing things. And as they get older, that becomes more and more of a thing. And it's actually a very natural thing. They're becoming autonomous. They're becoming uh, an adult. They're, they're moving towards being able to operate without you, which is a, a really good thing. And, and part of what happens is, as kids grow, they look at everything you're doing and they start to question some of the assumptions you've made in your life or some of the things you hold true in, in the way you see the world. And they're questioning it not so much just to challenge you or to provoke you. I mean, I guess sometimes kids do that. But they're questioning it because they're trying to figure out what they believe. And they're like, well, I, I'm beginning to understand that mom and, you know, mom and dad, they believe these things, but uh, I've got to figure out what I believe. I don't just automatically believe what they believe. And, and I've got to figure out what I believe versus what they believe. And it isn't necessarily that they're not going to believe the same things that you believe on any given topic. But they're going to weigh all of that. And so as your kids get older, uh, they start to want to talk to you, hopefully talk to you, about things where they might not see things exactly the way you see things. And they may not see the world exactly the way you see the world. And, um, and obviously the world's changed a little bit since you were a kid. So the perceptions are, are, are different. And it is in that moment where dads must strive to be uh, not just available to talk, but to be open to talk about things, uh, to be open to discuss things, to be open to, uh, uh, to ponder things together. Uh, that maybe they have just assumed was true for uh, a good part of their lives. And all kids are going to uh, uh, challenge their parents' assumptions on some level at some point. Some of them in big ways, 
and some of them in little ways, but it's always going to happen, and you shouldn't feel uh, weird about that or feel that something's broken about that. It's just part of the process. I love in the Bible where God at one point refers to himself. He says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, you know, he appeared to Abraham, and he showed himself to Abraham, and he taught so much about himself to Abraham. But he says, listen, I'm not just Abraham's God. I'm not just the God of your grandfathers. I'm not just the God of your forefathers. I'm not just the God of your parents. He goes, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he was the same God, teaching the same things. I'm not saying that God changes or anything like that. But he had to deal with Jacob in a slightly different way than he dealt with Abraham. And he had to deal with Isaac in a different way than he dealt with Abraham or or Jacob. Jacob was a runner. Uh, Jacob was always running from God. Jacob ends up wrestling with God. Famously, he wrestles with God. And some people receive from God, and some people just wrestle through everything. They just wrestle all the time. And God was fine with that. You know, God was like, I can handle this. And, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. And so, as parents, a lot of times we, we want our kids just to believe exactly what we believe and see exactly what we see. But uh, really what God's calling us to do is say, look, you know, it's okay that your kids see things in a different... They almost by necessity have to see things in a different way than you do. They were raised in a different time. They were raised in a different culture. Uh, and they may see things a little differently. And your job is not to say, um, you know, uh, everybody shut up and just agree with me. (laughs) Uh, Your job is to be willing to talk about things. In fact, uh, we have a great role model in this. I want you to look at the next verse. Look at how what God says to all his people in the next verse. Look at what he says. He says this. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Now, this verse is talking about how God is coming to his people, and he says, you, you've wandered far off, and I want you to come back, and uh, I'm, I'm going I'm to uh, cleanse you and all this kind of stuff. But the very first part of this verse is very interesting. He invites them to come reason with him. He goes, let's just, let's just sit down and reason together. Let's just sit down and talk. Now, if anybody doesn't need to reason with other people, or sit down and sort of go back and forth with the people. It's God. God knows everything. He's always right. He's never wrong. He doesn't need any new information. He doesn't need his view changed. He doesn't need to be educated by anybody. He doesn't need any of that. Now, we need that. <laughs> we need all those things. I, I, nobody knows everything. Nobody's seen everything. I know some people that think they know everything, and they think they've seen everything. Uh, but all of us, we need to grow and learn and you know, and learn from each other. That, that's fine. And, but if anybody ever needed, if anybody could have said, you know what, I really don't need to reason with you. I just want you to sit down and listen to me. It could be God. But God says, all right, look, you guys aren't getting it, and I just want to sit down and talk with you about it. I just want to sit down and talk with you about it. And God is our role model in this. God is like, I'm okay. Um, I mean, God's clearly right. <laughs> In this scripture, he's clearly always right, but he says, I'm okay processing it with you. Even if you disagree with me, I'm okay processing it with you. Because, guys, here's what I found. Uh, This is something I believe. I I can't prove this from scripture, but this is just something I believe. I found that people that are confident in their beliefs aren't afraid to reason with other people. They're not afraid to sit down and reason together. Let's talk it through. Let's just talk it through. People that are shaky about their beliefs or they don't know what they believe uh, or they're just trying to defend an indefensible position that they know is indefensible, they don't want to reason together. They don't want to sit down and talk. They don't want to process together because they realize that they're just going to be exposed in some way. But people that are very confident in what they believe um, generally can say, well, yeah, we'll sit down and talk about it. I don't, you know, let's sit down. And, and, and what God would say is, I, I want you to be Uh, Somebody that will reason with other people, and I want you to be, you know what we would call that? We would say that somebody's reasonable, that they're reasonable. I remember one time I was working, I started working at this new company, and I worked for this guy that was just beneath the grand poobah, the big leader of the company, and I was going to, it was very new, I think I'd been there a couple of weeks, and I was going to have to go and kind of break some bad news and make a big ask uh, for some stuff that we needed. And it felt very weird to me 
to be the new guy going to the, the boss man and sort of telling him, you know, we're missing the boat with this and we're going to spend some money here and this kind of stuff. And I remember talking to my direct report. I remember explaining, I'm, I guess I need to go talk to this guy or whatever. And he said, you know what? He goes, don't worry about it. He says, he, he says he, he's a reasonable man. He's just reasonable. He goes, if you, can, if you can present your case in a reasonable way, he will listen to you. He's a reasonable man. And I remember it just, it made me feel so good. It's like, oh, okay, I'm not going to talk to somebody who's just going to yell at me. I'm not going to talk to somebody that doesn't want to hear anything. Oh, the boss is reasonable. Wow, well, what an interesting concept. That's amazing. <laughs> and uh, it's the same way, you know. God says, I want dads to be reasonable. And I want them to be willing to sit down and, and reason and discuss. And, and I'll just put in here, I, I don't mean endless arguments. I don't mean uh, fruitless debates. I don't mean yelling and screaming. God's not saying dads should you know, have to be subjected to that all the time or something like that. But if, but if, if you have somebody in your life, uh, dad or not, if you have somebody in your life that has a serious question and wants to sit down and reason with you, I think God would want all of us, certainly the dads, but all of us say, yeah, I'll sit down and talk with you. I'll sit down and ponder with you. I'll sit down and process with you. I'll try to see this from your perspective. I'm open to being educated. I'm open to seeing things in a different way. I'm open... Uh, to approaching this in a different way. I'm, I really want to be a reasonable person. And all this just boils down to this. Dads, the bottom line is this. God wants our kids to feel like they can come and talk to us about anything. Delicate stuff, sensitive stuff, odd stuff, disagreeable stuff. Stuff that they know will fly in the face of what we think and what we believe or what we hold true. That, that, they, that they would feel like this son evidently felt. I'm about to go ask dad for some weird, you know, I'm about to ask dad for half of everything he owns before he dies. Uh, he's not going to just run me out of the house. He's not going to just scream and throw things. My dad is a dad that will listen. My dad is a dad that will listen to me. And I think that's what God wants us to emulate there. All right, so that's the first thing, that as dads, uh, we would be open and approachable, okay? The second thing, if you write this down, uh, that we should be striving to do is we should strive to be a reflection of God. Would you write that down, please? That we should be a reflection of God. At the end of the day, I think this is why God created dads. You know, God didn't have to set it up so that there were dads on earth. He could have set it up in a different number of ways. But he created the idea of fatherhood. And he created the idea of dads. And he wanted every kid to have a dad, you know. And the reason why he did that uh, was so that he could start to show all of us what a heavenly father should look like. Uh, that we could get a good sense of uh, what, what it means to be loved by a father. Now, obviously, we live in a broken world, and some people have never experienced real fatherly love. But God's intention has always been that earthly fathers would reflect the Heavenly Father, so that we would have a good handle on what, what a Heavenly Father is and that kind of thing. He wanted dads in the world so people could have this um, reflection of Him. So look at how the prodigal son's story continues here. It's kind of a lengthy passage, but here we go. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs, which was not great for a Jew. The young man became so hungry that, he even, that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned before heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So we have a lot going on there, but the prodigal son, he leaves. The father gives him half the estate. He leaves wealthy, and he goes and he blows it. He just blows it. And he makes a lot of really bad decisions, and now he has no money. He's in a distant land. The Bible says he's far away, you know. And 
He's hit rock bottom, and just about the time he hit rock bottom, it says a famine hit the land. And isn't that the way it goes? <laughs> you make bad decisions and bad circumstances come at the same time. He made really bad decisions and then bad circumstances hit at the same time. And so he's starving to death. The Bible says he's wasting away, that he's wasted everything. He's wasted himself. He's wasted his, his inheritance. He's wasted all this opportunity on wild living. Uh, we're told elsewhere that it's on prostitutes and all this kind of stuff. And so he eventually finds a farmer, a Gentile farmer. This is a good Jewish boy. And he says, uh, is there anything I can do that, to earn some kind of keep here? And he says, well, you can feed the pigs. Pigs were, to the Jews were unclean, unholy animals. And here he is slopping the pigs. And the Bible says uh, that the slop they were feeding the pigs, he longed for the slop. That's how hungry he was, but he wasn't allowed to eat the slop. And I don't understand his, uh, uh, his employment there with the farmer. It, doesn't, it says nobody gave him anything. So I don't know if he's, you know, sometimes you start, you don't get paid for two weeks. I don't really know what's going on. But we, we have him starving to death while he's working. He's not allowed to eat the slop. He's feeding the pigs. And the Bible says he comes to his senses. And he starts thinking about a couple of things. And the first thing he thinks about is he thinks about his dad, and then he thinks about his home. And what he realizes about his dad is, is, is interesting for us. He says, you know, at my home, my dad is a businessman. My dad has uh, employees. Dad was evidently pretty wealthy. My dad's got a lot of employees. He says, every one of my dad's employees live better than I'm living right now. Every one of my dad's employees has plenty to eat. It's not working like I'm working. I'm working feeding a pig, and I'm still starving to death, and I don't have anything, and nobody's going to give me anything. And what he realizes is this. He's like, you know, back home, my dad treats people well. My dad's not some kind of tyrant that won't pay people. He's got employees that are happy, employees that are well-fed, employees that do well. He treats people well. And he thinks to himself, I could go home. I could go back home. And I could, I, I, my dad would never receive me as a son because I've blown it. But my dad is a reasonable man. You guys remember that? And he's open to hard conversations. And maybe because of that, I could go to him. And I know he treats people well. He's a good, godly man. Maybe I just go to him and say, look, I don't, I'm not asking to be a son. I know that's crazy talk. But if you could just... Make me an entry-level employee in the organization. I know that you're so good to your employees and you're a godly man, you'll treat me right. And he decides to go home. And the thing that brings him home is not necessarily that he was starving. He was starving makes him think. You know, when you experience pain in your life, you start to think. <laughs> he starts to think. But the thing that brought him home was his dad treated people right. That's the thing that hit him. And why does his dad treat people right? Because he's trying to be a godly man. And he's trying to be a godly man because at the end of the day, he's trying to reflect the heavenly father. And the thing that draws the son home, the thing that the son says is one, that he was reasonable, that he's open to hard conversations. We've already talked about that. But also he's like, he just treats people right. He remembered the kindness of, and the character of his dad. And that was enough to say. I'd rather be an entry level employee with my dad. And be around somebody like that in that character. Than be without him. To be lost. To be wasted. At the end of the day he was saying this. I can count on my, my dad. To do godly things. His dad was a good reflection of a great God. He wasn't a perfect reflection, but he was a good reflection. We have a man trying to live in a godly way. And because he's trying to live that way, it makes an indelible imprint on his son. His son, through all of it, remembers his dad's character. His dad's care. His dad's godliness. And that's how God wants it. He wants us to reflect. If we're dads, He wants us to reflect 
the heavenly Father in everything we do. This man was a godly businessman. He was also a godly father, and you know, but he's a godly businessman. This is why we're seeing this right here. This is in this illustration. He's trying to be godly in everything he does, how he handles his money and how he treats people and how he lives his life. So the question is, how do you reflect the heavenly father in your life? Look at the next verse to me. It says this. Follow God's example in everything you do, just as a much-loved child imitates his father. Isn't that a wonderful verse? It's a command not just for dads, it's a command to all of us, but certainly to the dads. It says, follow God's example in everything you do. Well, how do you follow God's example in everything you do? Well, you've got to study him. You've got to get up close. You've got to think about how would God respond in this situation? What would God do? You can't really reflect light unless you're looking at the light. You know, If you're a mirror, you've got you to find the light. You've got to kind of get close to it. You've got to get in proximity of it and focus on it. And then you can start to reflect the light. So God says, study me and study my ways. and Study my tone. Study where I focus my time and energy. And you'll learn a lot. And then you can reflect me. And you can be an example to other people. He wants you to do that. He wants you to be an example. You know, preaching, it's been said that preaching, what I do or attempt to do, (laughs) is taking the timeless words and principles of God and trying to figure out how to apply them to our culture today. What, what would, how would God respond to the things that we are dealing with today? That's what preaching is. But you know what? To be a Christ follower is kind of the same thing. A Christ follower is this. God's principle, God's power, God's word, God's character. How do I translate that into my life? How do I take God's character and apply it to where I work? How to take God's character and apply it to my family and friends and my neighbors and my community? How do I take what God teaches and what God does and how how do I reflect Him? How do I follow His example into my daily stuff? That's what the prodigal's father did. He he said, I'm not just going to be a guy that loves God and then mistreats my employees. He said, I'm going to love God and love my kids and I'm going to treat people right. I'm going to treat my employees right. He didn't know that that was going to be the big hook to bring his son back to him. But the son noticed that. You remember that children, Scripture tells us here that children tend to imitate their fathers. <laughs> well, their parents, not just their fathers, but their parents. They tend to imitate them. It's really weird. It's weird to see yourself, uh, I don't know if you've ever done something, you're like, that's just what my dad would have done. That's just what my dad would have said in that moment. That's just what my dad... It's not intentional. It's not something you're trying to do. You just find yourself... Huh. As I'm getting older, some of you are too young to get this, but as you get older, you sometimes you'll... I don't think I particularly look like my dad in, in such a strong way, but sometimes I'll catch a corner of myself in a mirror or a reflection in a car window or something, and I'm like, it just looks like my dad. I'm starting to look like my dad. Except, unfairly, he had hair his entire life. <laughs> no such luck for me, you know. Whether you want to or not, you, 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 you start emulating what you see around you. And sometimes you can intentionally push away from it, but a lot of times you just sort of emulate what you see around you. And the truth is, people are always watching you. They're always watching you. And you've got to decide, what am I going to model What am I modeling? Not just at church on Sundays, not just when I'm talking about God. What am I modeling day-to-day work, grocery shopping, and life? What am I modeling? I think what God is saying to us here is build so many godly things into your life, just trying to reflect me on every level that you can. You're not perfect, but you just try. Build so many godly things in your life that maybe, just maybe, your kids will catch some of them. Maybe they'll remember some of them when they need to remember them, but maybe, maybe they'll find themselves treating people well because you always treated people well. Or being courteous because you were always courteous. Or being conscientious because you were always conscientious. Find themselves, you know, I, I, got, I learned that from my dad. My dad always did that. 
whether you sit down and teach them or not, that you would reflect God. All right, that brings us to number three. The third thing that we need to focus on, uh, we need to lean into being filled with love. Write that down, please. We, got, we need to lean, lean into being filled with love. Every dad should work on being filled with love. None of this works without love. Of course, if you're going to reflect God in any way, shape, or form, we've got to have a lot of love uh, in that equation. Uh, let's look back at the prodigal son's story. Look what it says here. So he turned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, the father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. I love this. So the son's been away for a long time. We don't know how long, but we know that he traveled to a distant land. He blew through a ton of money. Um, he got a job. Uh, he, he's wasting away. He's starving to death. He finally comes to his senses, and then he makes that long journey home. So he's been gone a while. And we don't know how long he's been gone, but here's what we do know from this story. The father has been looking out on the horizon every day. Every day. Looking, is this the day when my son comes home? And when he sees him, his overriding feeling is not anger. <laughs> his overriding feeling is that he's filled with compassion and love. And the Bible says he runs out to meet him. And he runs out not to say, I told you so, not to rebuke him not to get on to him. Clearly, here's what happens. He sees his emaciated, starving, rag-covered, filthy son coming over the hill. You don't have to be Einstein to know what's happened. He went away with a ton of money. <coughs> Excuse me. He went away with a ton of money, and he comes back later looking rough. You ever seen somebody that you haven't seen in a while and you can just tell they've been living a rough life? You can just tell it. They don't say a word. He sees his son coming up. Pig slop spilled on him. Walking down a dry road. Dusty, dirty, filthy, in rags. And he knows. He's blown it all. He's blown all the money. He's wasted everything. He's hurting himself physically. And here he comes back because he's got nothing. But he doesn't run out to say, I told you so. The Bible says he ran out to show him love. I would just throw this out there to you. When somebody comes to you and they've been, they've been hurting because they've caused the pain, don't spend a lot of time going over the obvious. You shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have done that. Look what you've done to yourself. Look, you know, they know. They know. They're not looking to you to be reminded of how they've blown it. I imagine the prodigal son thought about that the entire trip home. What they're looking to you is not to be reminded of how they went wrong. What they're looking to you to see is, do you care? Do you care about me? And thankfully, that's what the Father is focusing on here. He's not focusing on the obvious. Look at you. Look at your clothes. Look how filthy you are. Where's the money? None of that. The Bible says he ran up to him, embraced him, and kissed him. I would challenge you to love enough to push through the distances that separate you. I would challenge you to love enough to draw them close despite the differences. And to love enough to kiss them through the dirt <laughs> and the filth. To just embrace 
and love. And of course, that's what God does to us all the time. All the time. He's our perfect role model in this. Check out this next verse. Look what it says. It says this. Mostly what God does is love you. (laughs) Keep company with Him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of Himself to us. Love like that. Man, I love that verse. He says the thing God mostly does is love us. You know what God's doing most of the time in heaven? I guess He's running the universe. He's keeping gravity working. He's keeping matter working. You know, reality in check and all this stuff. But most of the time what He's doing is He's loving us. That's what He's doing most of the time. And He says, listen, that's what God's doing most of the time. He says, so keep company with God. He says, focus on God. Sit with God. And learn how to live a life of love. I love that he says learn it, because what he, what he, but it would be really bad if he says just love everybody, because it's like, I don't know how to do that. But he says learn it, what he's saying is this is something you can learn. This is something God wants to teach you, how to love everybody. I'm not talking about human love. He even goes into that. He says, listen, there's a love where I love so that I get something from you. And then there's a love where I love so that I can just give everything I have for you. Those are two different kind of loves. There's a human love, and then there's A holy love, a godly love. Human love just fades away. It's fickle. It's all over the map. You can't count on it. It, You know, it's okay. He says, but what you really need to have in your life is you got to have this love from God, a love like Christ. He He says, sit with God, soak up God's love, and then turn around and learn how to love. And he says, and then go love like that. Love not to get something from somebody but love them to give them everything you can. Dads, be loving, be loving, be loving, be affectionate and be loving and be generous with love and love to give, not to get. Just love and love and love. That brings us to the fourth thing. If you write it down, the fourth thing every dad needs to be working on (laughs) is that we've got to be reassuring and receptive reassuring and receptive. Look at what this great father did here in the end. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. (laughs) They had a party. But I love how this goes. First of all, the son, he's been practicing this speech the whole way back. What am I going to say when I see my dad? He says, I've sinned against heaven and you. It's funny that he, he thought of his dad is being so godly that he put those together. Because I've sinned against heaven and and you. You know, those things are real close. They're not the same, but they're real close. Because I've sinned against you, and I'm not worthy to be your son. I'm I'm not here to ask to be your son. I just want to be an employee. I just want minimum wage here. Just an entry-level job somewhere in the organization. I just need you know, some help. I'm not worthy. And interestingly, the dad completely ignores the speech. Just ignores it. And he turns to his servants. He says, this is my son. He needs clean clothes. He needs sandals on his feet. Get him a ring. What's the ring? It was a signet ring. Signet ring had your family symbol on it and used it to sign contracts and wax. He's given him power of attorney. None of this is going to be an employee business. I'm giving you the family ring, put clean clothes on you, put new sandals on you, 
It gets you to look right. And that calf that we've been fattening up for some big special occasion, we're going to have that. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have a party. Because my son is home. Dads, um, you have a very important role to play in your kids' lives for their whole lives. And it centers around this idea of worthiness. If somebody makes a, a horrible mistake, they don't feel real worthy of love. But you've got to convince your kids that they're worthy of it regardless. And there's also, in our society, a lot of messages are coming at your kids nonstop. Even if they're adults, it's coming at them all the time. Social media is telling you you don't cut it. Advertising, marketing tells you you've got to have this or that so that people are really going to like you and you'll be worthy of love. and All these different things. All of us, we're being bombarded with things that are telling us that we're just not quite cutting it. We're not really worthy. But a dad... A good godly dad will take it upon himself to tell his kids, to reassure them, you are most certainly worthy. You are my child. You're my son, and I love you. And nothing can make me, nothing can make me stop loving you. And you have worth, and you have been and will always be a part of this family. You're not an employee. You're not a servant. You are my son. They all know that the son's blown it. They all know the son's done some stupid things. They all know the son's wasted a lot of money. But they're not dwelling on that. They're dwelling on the most wonderful thing in the world. They've been reunited. At least his son didn't die. And he's home. And he's forgiven. The story has so much impact because of this radical forgiveness. When Jesus taught it, the people that heard it would have just, it would have blown their minds to hear this story. Nobody, nobody in that day and age would have ever thought that the son would get new clothes and sandals and a signet ring and a party. Jesus taught it that way. He taught it to have some shock value to it so that they understood. He said, this is what your heavenly father does and this is what earthly fathers should do too. Fathers, do whatever you can to reassure your kids of God's unshakable love for them and your unshakable love for them and your faith in them and their uniqueness and their worth in God's eyes and in yours. Do whatever you can to help restore them and reassure them. Get them clean robes and get them a ring for their finger. and Call them a son instead of a servant. And lastly, and probably most importantly, Remember to throw as many parties as you can. <laughs> they had barbecue. That's in the Bible, people. I'm just preaching the Bible. They had barbecue. They had a party. What is that about? The last part of that verse is, and then the party began. It's about celebrating wins. It's about looking for things to celebrate. I can't celebrate that you wasted half my estate. I can't celebrate that you ran away and hurt yourself. And I can't celebrate all the things you did to yourself. But I can celebrate that you're home. I can celebrate that you're alive. I can celebrate that you're here with me. I can celebrate that you're still my son. I can celebrate that we can have a future together. I can celebrate all these things and a lot more. And I'm going to celebrate every good thing I can. Every little win 
And every time you get up from every loss you have, I am going to celebrate. you got somebody in your corner. I'm going to celebrate. Because at the end of the day, you mean everything in the world to him, and you mean everything in the world to me. Will you join me for a word of prayer? Lord, thank you for being such a wonderful father to us all. Thank you for modeling all this for all of us. Lord, we ask you on this day to bless and encourage all the dads today. Father, being a dad is a, uh, it's a wonderful gift. It's also a big responsibility. So, Lord, I pray that for every dad, Lord, that they would never try to face fatherhood alone. Help them to lean on you and rely on you. Help them to just be with you and watch you and then copy your example. Just to emulate what they see in you. Your love, your care, your reassurance, your grace, all those things. Lord, I ask you to be particularly today with those that maybe are having a rough time. Lord, for some folks... Father's Day is a very difficult day. Maybe their dad is no longer here, or maybe their dad was never really there. Regardless, I thank you that you say that you are the father of the fatherless, so please help them to look to you for all their fatherly needs. I know, I know you are open to receiving all of them because of who you are. And with everybody still praying, maybe on this Father's Day you've realized that you're the prodigal. You're the prodigal in this story. Maybe you've come to your senses at last and you've realized you need to come home. I'd love to lead you in a simple prayer about coming home to God. So if you're ready to give your life to Christ or recommit your life to Him, just please pray this prayer with me right now. Say, Jesus, I give my life to you. I'm ready to come home. I've come to my senses. I'm tired of wasting away and hurting myself. I thank you that you every day have been looking on the horizon. You've been watching and waiting and looking for me to start heading towards you. And I thank you, Lord, that even now as I head towards you, you are running towards me. Running towards me, not with a lot of I told you so's, not with anger, not with rage, just filled with compassion and love. And Lord, I just ask you to receive me. As you receive all prodigals. I thank you what's awaiting me is your embrace and your kiss and your reinstatement of me and the family and a party. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lord, that there is forgiveness and redemption, healing and reconciliation in you. I give my very self to you today. Thank you for making me a Christian. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Let everybody please say amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. Well, folks, um, I felt God there. I hope you did too. <laughs> As we were studying his word, what an amazing a heavenly Father we have, and uh, on this Father's Day, I hope you acknowledge uh, your earthly father, if you can, and uh, any other people that have been fatherly to you in your life, but certainly I hope that you will acknowledge your heavenly Father. Uh, hey, if you uh, prayed that prayer to come home to him today, wow, what a wonderful thing. God is literally throwing a party in heaven right now for you. Uh, just text FOUND to the number on your screen if you wouldn't let us know. We want to pray for you. And Send you some stuff in the mail. and uh, uh, Guys, I'm going to let you go now. If you want to give, you can uh, text GIVE to the number on your screen there and give, and we'd appreciate that. But really, today is about all the dads. Dads, we love you. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. I hope you are pampered and taken care of, and you have fun and all those kind of things. And I hope more than anything else that you know that your heavenly Father looks down on you and says, Good job. Thank you for trying 
to be a dad. It's a hard gig, uh, but I see you trying. And uh, I pray that you uh, are encouraged to know that he's willing to help you and to uh, work with you. So we're going to finish up today uh, with one more song. Again, happy Father's Day. We'll see you next week. God bless. Jesus.